This is Unsung History, the podcast where we discuss people and events in American history that haven't always received a lot of attention. I'm your host, Kelly Therese Pollack. I'll start each episode with a brief introduction to the topic and then talk to someone who knows a lot more than I do. Be sure to subscribe to Unsung History on your favorite podcasting app so you never miss an episode. And please, Tell your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, maybe even strangers to listen to. Today's story is about the Alaska Territorial Guard, or ATG. In the 1940s, Alaska was not yet a state, but a territory of the United States. As World War II loomed, aside from Lieutenant General Simon Bolivar Buckner, Jr., the U.S. military decided that Alaska was not important militarily. In 1937, U.S. Army Chief of Staff General Malin Craig said, quote, The mainland of Alaska is so remote from the strategic areas of the Pacific that it is difficult to conceive of circumstances in which air operations therefrom would contribute materially to the national defense, unquote. With that thinking, Alaska National Guard units were moved to Washington State in August 1941. By early 1942, a Japanese Navy reconnaissance unit was surveying the Alaska coastline. Submarines and aircraft were spotted, and in June 1942, the Japanese Navy bombed the Dutch Harbor Naval Operating Base and Fort Mears on Amiknak Island in Alaska. In the only invasion of the United States during World War II, the Japanese invaded and occupied two Aleutian Islands, Atu and Kiska. The U.S. government evacuated 881 Unanga from nine villages in response to this aggression and set their homes on fire so they would not fall into Japanese hands. The Unanga were forcibly interned in southeast Alaska, in facilities without plumbing or electricity for two years, where many died of disease. The Japanese invasion of Alaskan islands was enough to finally convince the military of the strategic importance of Alaska. Major Marvin R. Marston, also known as Muktuk Marston, had already conceived of a plan to defend the Alaskan coast with local citizens. And Alaska Territorial Governor Ernest Grunig approved. Alaska Command assigned Major Marston and Captain Carol Schreibner as military aides to Governor Grunig, who would serve as Commander-in-Chief, and they started forming citizen units. From the formal inception of the Alaska Territorial Guard in June 1942, until it was disbanded in March 1947. More than 6,300 members joined, according to the official roster, but many more Alaskan civilians helped the ATG by providing equipment, supplies, and food. Except for the 21 staff officers in full-time paid positions, everyone else in the Alaska Territorial Guard was an unpaid volunteer. The group included at least 27 women, many of whom served as nurses in the field hospital at Kutsibu. One of the women, Laura Belts Wright of Haycock, was known as the sharpshooter in her company, scoring 98% bullseyes. The Alaska Territorial Guard members were as young as 12 and as old as 80 and represented 107 Alaskan communities and many different ethnic groups, including Anunga, Inupiaq, Tlingit, and Yupik, among others. With the mission of defending the 6,640-mile Alaskan coast, the ATG trained for enemy combat, patrolled and shot down Japanese air balloons carrying bombs and radios, constructed buildings and airstrips, transported equipment and supplies, 
distributed food and ammunition, and broke trails through the Alaskan wilderness. The Alaskan natives were well prepared for this kind of work, with intimate knowledge of the Alaskan terrain and weather, and experience hunting with rifles. Without the ATG serving as the eyes and ears of the U.S. military in Alaska, the Japanese may well have invaded the mainland of the territory, setting up an ideal location from which to invade the United States. Despite their importance, the contribution of the ATG was largely ignored by the U.S. military after the ATG disbanded in 1947. In 2000, Alaska's senior senator, Ted Stevens, who himself was a World War II veteran, sponsored a bill to recognize the ATG. The legislation was signed into law and ordered the Secretary of Defense to issue honorable discharges to Americans who served in the ATG. Alaska's Department of Military and Veteran Affairs set up a task force to notify former members and their families of the benefits due to them. In a 2009 press release praising the passage of legislation to restore retirement benefits for ATG members, Alaska Senator Lisa Murkowski wrote, quote, The Alaska Territorial Guard was our primary defense against further incursions into our great land. The members of the Alaska Territorial Guard agreed to put their lives on the line to defend Alaska. The sacrifice and commitment to the defense of America was no less significant than that of our active duty forces. Joining me to help us learn more about the Alaska Territorial Guard is Dr. Holly Geis, who is a Nupiak and an assistant professor of history at the University of New Mexico. Her research focuses on gender, Anunga relocation and internment camps, Native activism and resistance, and Indigenous military service during the war. In the show notes, I'll put a link to a nonprofit that raises funds for Atuans to travel back to their home island of Atu for pilgrimages and cultural revitalization. If you're able, I hope that you'll donate. Hi, Holly. Thanks so much for joining me today. Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, so we're going to talk about the Alaska Territorial Guard. And I, I have to say, before I looked at your World War II Alaska site, I had no idea that this existed. So it's super exciting for me to learn about. So I wanted to start with just asking, you know, how you got into this topic as something to research and, and you know, look more closely at. Yeah. So the interesting thing is I had heard some stories about the Alaska Territorial Guard growing up. I was born and raised in Anchorage, Alaska, and my family is from Unicleet, which is an Inupiat village in uh, like northwestern Alaska. So my grandpa, Lowell Anagik, was in the Alaska Territorial Guard. And so he had told some stories about that when I was growing up. And at some point, he even mentioned someone named Muktuk Marston. And I remember asking him, who's Muktuk Marston? And his answer is kind of funny because he said, you better get to know who Muktuk Marston is. <laughs> You're like, I'm trying to. <laughs> yeah, he, he didn't really tell me, but it was more like figure it out yourself, kind of, you know, look into it. And then it was probably uh, at least like a decade later or something that I actually started kind of delving into this World War II Alaska history. And there was Muktuk Marston, like pretty prevalent, like within the Inupiat and Yupik community with the Alaska Territorial Guard formation. Yeah, oh, that's so neat. So one of the things I'm always curious about, uh, and certainly in in this instance, is uh, is the sources for research and sort of how you do research. Uh, you know, I I imagine a lot of times when you're doing military research that there's big military archives, but that might not have been the case here. You know, and so how you get at uh, at this history, at these kind of stories that that you want to tell. Yeah. I think a lot of that goes back to my training from undergrad. So I know that makes me sound kind of hopefully not too junior varsity, (laughs) but, you know, back when I was in undergrad, I read an article about Alaskan segregation during the 1940s, and it was written by Terrence Cole. And after I read the piece, 
I thought, well, this is really great, but what do Native people have to say about feeling segregated and being segregated before the passage of the 1945 Alaska Equal Rights Act? So I received some great mentorship from Professor Matt Snip in the Native American Studies Department at Stanford when I was an undergrad. And he helped me get funding through the Community Service Research Internship through the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity. And with that funding, I received mentorship from the Alaska Native Policy Center, also the first Alaskans Institute. So I received this mentorship um, from community-based organizations and Native organizations in Alaska alongside academic mentorship from my advisor. And that's really how the Oral History Project took off. So this community mentorship really helped me kind of get to know people within the community. At this time, um, I was kind of like a co-intern through the First Alaskans Institute. And there were probably like 30 other, you know, young adult, (laughs) college-aged Native students. And people were saying, well, you should interview my grandma. You should talk to this person. You should go to this town. And so with the research funds, I was able to kind of travel to different places around Alaska and connect with people. And I really think that the interviews were successful because of the snowball method. So basically meeting someone from through their grandparents or something. And then after the interview, asking, do you know someone else in town I should talk to? And then I would call up the other person and say, hey, I just talked to so-and-so. Can I talk to you later today or tomorrow? (laughs) So the project kind of like, the project kind of took on like very naturally. And, um, and I really can't stress enough how important like the community mentorship was with the oral history project taking off. What does that process of oral history interviews look like? How do you get at the experiences? How do you get at sort of putting a narrative together when you're talking to people? How do you know what what to ask them, who, you know, what to talk about, um, and, and then sort of put all of these sort of disparate sources, sources being people together. Yeah, that's a really great question. Like, how do you know what questions to ask? And, um, how do you find information like solely through the oral histories or also with the archives? And it's definitely a combination of both. Uh, the one thing I'll say about the archives is the archives tend to lack direct Native perspectives. So a lot of the archives that have information about Native people aren't usually written by Native people, or if it's a photograph of Native people, sometimes it doesn't even say the names of a Native person, you know? So um, I think for that reason, the oral history is, is really important. And the other thing I would say about the oral histories is it really fits within um, kind of traditional ways of acquiring knowledge within the Native community. So like the way you would learn information, like um, I'm speaking generally here, but the way you would kind of learn information if you're Alaska Native is kind of learning from the elders, right? And so this is also an interesting way that the oral histories kind of fit this um, Indigenous framework too. Yeah, that's really neat. So uh, as you have talked to people, on, and we can talk some about your your other research as well, but specifically about the Alaska Territorial Guards, you know, what what were the motivations people had uh, for for joining up with, you know, this service that that they didn't even get paid for? So the, the overwhelming majority of them are uh, volunteers and there's sort of this huge age range of, of who is participating. So what, why did they get involved? Why Why was this something that they wanted to do? Yeah, they had a number of reasons for being involved. I think The primary reason was fear of imminent attack by Japan. So in June of 1942, Japan invaded the Aleutian Islands of Attu and Kiska, um, took Attuan prisoners of war to Hokkaido, the North Island of Japan, and um, also bombed Dutch Harbor, uh, which was where uh, a U.S. base was. And basically, basically Native people chose to ally with the U.S. to defend the coastline from further invasion. And while this seems kind of like long ago, and while it also seems kind of on the peripheries of empire, (laughs) Alaska had a lot of strategic value um, in terms of kind of being this place that's like a borderland straddling between the empires of U.S., Canada, Russia, and Japan. And Alaska itself, the landscape had also been kind of contested by these several empires for, you know, several kind of decades and generations, right? 
Um, there's even like accounts of like Japanese fishermen poaching waters and other things like that, like before the war. So basically, um, it's kind of it's kind of no surprise that there's tension at the borderlands, right? <laughs> but I do think that when Native people saw the opportunity to ally with the U.S. military and to utilize resources, um, for example, World War I era Enfield rifles, they seized on that opportunity. And it's actually very similar to other regions of the Pacific. So I was reading a book just the other day by Stacy Salinas called Pine Gorillas. And it's actually about Filipina women who formed guerrilla platoons during World War II to kind of guard the Philippines. So there's other parts of the Pacific where we have um, kind of native nations or other nations selecting to ally with U.S. empire at this time instead of Japan. Yeah, that, wow, that is fascinating. And what were the kinds of things, you know, if if what they're doing is is trying to ally with the U.S. to, uh, to protect their homeland, uh, but also to to make sure that Japan doesn't get this valuable resource. You know what? What were the kinds of things? What were the kinds of ways that uh, that the territorial guard was was able to do that? You know what? What were the kinds of uh, methods? What kinds of training did they have? Yeah, you know it's interesting because a, a lot of the training included drills. So major. Marvin Marston, who acquired the nickname Muktuk Marston because he could eat as he could eat as much muktuk as the Inupiat people. <laughs> <laughs> muktuk is whale blubber. So it was kind of a, an endearing kind of nickname for him. And so Muktuk Marston kind of worked with the native tribes like on practicing these drills, distributing World War I era and field rifles. And in some cases, even giving old uniforms or like ATG badges. So some of the villages had kind of a, a uniform or a certain clothing, but then most of them had an ATG badge that they would put on their parka. And so they practiced drills, they checked for enemy planes, and they reported enemy planes. And at this time, there were Japanese planes that would fly overhead, that would fly over Alaska. And so they would report these, they would also identify the model of planes. So that way, the US military would know what models were flying over Alaska. And um, they would even do things to kind of protect their community, like by storing food in food caches and distributing food to those in need. So there were also a lot of social services that the ATG provided, in addition to having social activities like dances. <laughs> and these dances would include, you know, traditional native dances, right? <laughs> so yes, there would be jitterbugging, but there would also be kind of traditional drums and traditional native dances as well. So it was really a community organization. And um, while photographs tend to show Native men and even young and older Native men participating, there were a fair number of Native women who were also involved in the ATG, and some of them were even listed on the roster. So there are parallels, you know, like I was saying about uh, Stacey Salinas's work about the Philippines, about Filipina women kind of being in these guerrilla platoons. We see a similar thing in Alaska as well. And we're talking about sort of natives in Alaska, but that's not a monolith, right? There, there's a, a lot of different groups of natives within Alaska. You know, what were, was the ATG drawing from different tribal nations? You know, what what did that look like? And and did they all get along? You know, I assume yeah. historically, maybe they didn't all always get along. Uh, but at this point, did they? Yeah. You know, what's interesting is the Alaska Territorial Guard existed predominantly in coastal Alaska. So usually villages and towns in coastal Alaska. And so a large majority of the members were Inupiat and Yupit, which are the Alaskan Inuit who live along the coast. But, you know, across Alaska, Native men kind of answered the draft call and also volunteered for the service. So we also have like the Athabascans in interior Alaska, um, the Clinkett Haida Simshian of southeast Alaska, and then we have the Unanga who were in internment camps in Southeast Alaska during the war. So this is also an interesting thing about the Alaska Territorial Guard. When the U.S. military gave guns like World War I era Enfield rifles to the Inupiat and the Yupit, they also had the Unanga in internment camps during this time. So there's kind of a sharp contrast between the ways that certain native groups are being treated and I think a lot of that relates to 
forms of paternalism, you know, like basically thinking that you could protect one native group by confining them and removing them from a war zone. Um, but that's not recognizing their sovereignty and that's also not recognizing their humanity. So it was a very haphazard plan by the U.S. Navy to relocate the Unanga to internment camps in Southeast Alaska. Interestingly enough, a number of Unanga men, when they returned to their home islands after the war, did join the Alaska Territorial Guard. Hmm. So you can see that Native nations still chose an allyship with the U.S. military during this time um, leading into the Cold War. And so we've been saying territorial gardens, so we should put this in context for people that Alaska wasn't a state yet. Uh, so this was a, a territory at the time, and but statehood happened relatively soon after World War II. You know, is there a relationship there between these actions during World War II and then the the battle for statehood, or I don't know if it was a battle, maybe the, the move to statehood. <laughs> yeah, you, that's a great question about statehood, and in my opinion. Alaska and Hawaii are both only states because of World War II. So I think during World War II, the U.S. military and government recognized uh, the strategic value of Alaska and Hawaii as being states in the Pacific and also during the Cold War. <laughs> yeah. Oh, interesting. So we're talking about the Alaska Territorial Guard, but there are also uh, natives in Alaska who then sort of join the services and, you know, go and and fight. So you have also done some work around veterans. Uh, can you talk about that? So are are the people in the Territorial Guard, like, is, is there sort of a difference? Are they younger and older? Or, you know, who is deciding to to join the service and, and go overseas and, and who is staying home in the Guard? Yeah. You know, a number of the guys who were in the Alaska Territorial Guard later get drafted and then joined the armed forces. So I think that you could say that when you look at the village population of who's in the Alaska Territorial Guard, it might skew toward the elderly or also toward the teenage youth who can't quite enlist yet. So, yeah, I, I think that that also might be why some of the some of the age distributions look like that. But I have interviewed. Um, a number of veterans over the years. I'm also thinking of Arnold Booth, who's Simshian from Metlakatla, and he shared a number of stories about being stationed overseas um, across the Pacific, like in Papua New Guinea, the Philippines, and Australia. And some of the stories that he shared were really interesting because at this time, Native men could serve in integrated units with whites, right? Mm. So there are ways that Native people are being included in whiteness during this time period. However, Arnold Booth also shared stories about his superior sending him into the jungle first because he was an Indian and because the Indian will know and the Indian can see it, right? So there's these stereotypes of like a, I want to say noble savage, like kind of soldier who's able to see things with native eyes in the jungle, which couldn't be more different than Alaska, right? Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> Right. And so there's this kind of irony about the geography being different, but also like even if this whether this was supposed to be complementary to him or not, it did put his life more in danger. Right. Than the rest of rest of the guys in the in the unit. So. So, yeah, I do remember hearing some of those stories from Arnold Booth. So it's a really interesting time in being in the 1940s. And also where segregation exists in Alaskan towns as well. So Arnold Booth talks about during his oral history interview. I think he was trying to get from Ketchikan to Seattle. I think those were the two locations he said. And he wasn't able to get a ticket on the barge. I'm trying to remember this correctly. It's been a number of years since I heard it. But he ended up getting a haircut, like a military haircut, and getting his uniform pressed and ironed and put it on. And then when he went to get a ticket, they got him a ticket to Seattle. So there's also interesting ways that being in the service afforded some forms of equal citizenship rights, right? Or kind of equality in public spaces or in businesses. So if if I sort of understand uh, what happened with the Alaska Territorial Guard correctly, some of the benefits um, that, that 
you might normally get from being in the armed services benefits, you know, uh, all sorts of benefits about healthcare and retirement and uh, how you're buried and all of those sorts of things weren't initially given to the Alaska Territorial Guard, in addition to not being paid for their service <laughs> in the first place. But then there was more recent legislation uh, that that attempted to to sort of rectify that a little bit. Uh, so what? Why was it that they that they weren't sort of initially recognized for the the service that they gave? And and what uh, what sort of changed that? Why you know why are we now you know uh, twenty years ago finally saying oh hey we should we should recognize that? Yeah. You know, the Alaska Territorial Guard was disbanded in 1947, and in reading Muktuk Marston's book that he wrote that was published, I think, in the 60s, Muktuk Marston kind of gives a firsthand account of what it was like visiting these Native villages and kind of working with Native leaders with the Territorial Guard. And when the ATG, that's the kind of short version of it, when the ATG was disbanded, Muktuk Marston basically said it directly had to do with discrimination. So basically, uh, military officials did not see these as legitimate units. Um, They didn't really value the volunteer work by these Native men, even though a lot of the work during the war would not have been possible without the Native participation, right? Without these Native allies during this time, Native people could have allied with Russia or Japan during this time, right? So um, a lot of their contributions to the war effort were disregarded And there were certainly forms of um, racial discrimination directed at Native people during this time. But it wasn't until the year 2000 that Senator Lisa Murkowski worked to get the ATG veterans to kind of receive veteran status, right? So it wasn't until several decades later. And unfortunately, at that point, a number of these ATG members had passed away. But uh, for a number of these men, for example, Wesley Aiken from Utkyagvik, up up in the English name is Barrow. (laughs) I remember talking to Wesley. I think his native name is pronounced Ugiaktok. And I remember him telling me that he later served in the Alaska National Guard after being in the ATG um, for several decades. And I think Wesley was telling me that once the ATG was recognized as having veteran status, he got bumped into the next category of having a certain number of years of service. So there were some ATG veterans who were able to kind of add together their military service with their ATG experience added on. So you've been mentioning some of these oral history interviews that you did, uh, and I want to make sure people know that they can they can actually watch uh, or listen to some of them. Uh, so can you talk about this this digital history project uh, that you've done around World War II? Yeah, absolutely. So during my postdoc at University of California, Irvine, I was thinking I really wanted to make the oral histories accessible, and I wanted to kind of make the oral histories available to a broader or more public audience. So something that would also be different than written publications, like books, journals, other things like that in the academic realm. So I, one day I finally just decided to just buy the domain (laughs) for worldwar2alaska.com. So it started with buying the domain. And then from there, I did some research on like what platform I wanted to use. And in talking to a few other scholars, like uh, David Fedman was actually influential because um, he has this website called japanairraids.org. So I had seen that he had used Squarespace and he had, I, it was between that and WordPress. And I decided to go with Squarespace. So I bought the domain for World War II Alaska.com. And it was actually a bit easier than I would have thought to kind of navigate how you would put together the website. So the trickier part came with editing the oral history videos into like 10 minute videos and creating a YouTube channel, and basically embedding those YouTube videos in the website. So the website has, I think, about 10, maybe a little more oral histories from Native elders who talk about Unanga internment and relocation, the territorial guard, Native men in the service, and also the perspective of Native children during this time as civilians. Yeah, it's a really neat website. And now we'd like to play for you some audio from that website. This is a clip with World War II Army veteran, an ATG veteran, Holger Jorgi Jorgensen. <laughs> 
who's Inupiaq and Norwegian. In this clip, Jorgi talks about his work in the ATG. And in the latter part of the clip, he talks about joining the ATG at age 15. The other voice you'll hear is that of Bill Reimer, a friend of Jorgi's, who helped with the interview in 2015. Jorgi gave permission to Holly to use this audio in any context. If you'd like to hear a more complete interview with Jorgi, you can go to the World War II Alaska website. I'll put a link in the show notes. When I went to Nome, I went over there because I had joined the Territorial Guard, and the Territorial Guard was moving us in places where the defense wanted us to work. Right. In other words, uh, they brought us where they could make use of us, plus when we weren't working, we were doing stuff for the Guard. In other words, we were actually military. Yeah. That's what we were. But because a lot of us knew, had grown up in a mining camp, knew how to fish and hunt, they wanted us to work at the defense job there in Nome. They were starting to build an airport, and then a lot of buildings and stuff came up. So we would work for the, for the uh, U.S. Army. Yeah. And then we would tend to our guard stuff on... On our days off, which we never got any days off. So you just so worked we, every day. Right. It was a twenty. It was a seven-day week job. Wow, a lot and of hard labor, or no? I well, a lot of it was hard labor, but I lucked out. I was running equipment, so my labor was pretty easy because I learned how to run equipment out in the mine, and I learned how to weld. Wow, so, so you were I, welding. So I be I did a lot of their welding and I did mostly operating equipment. Now, how old were you, Georgie, when you first started doing that? Out in the mine, we started no, but at twelve. In, in Nome, you were like fifteen. Fifteen. I wow. went to Nome right after my fifteenth birthday. I joined the guard on my fifteenth birthday, and I wasn't accepted till oh February second, nineteen forty-two. Wow. Is when I got accepted into the Guard. And when I got accepted, that's when we went to Nome. Yeah. My grandfather was in the Alaska Territorial Guard in Unilakleet, um, Lowell Victor Anagik. And my grandma said that he had a badge and that they gave him a gun. Do you still have any of those items? I still have my rifle, that's all. Wow. I, I still got my rifle in the bedroom back there that was issued to me in 1942. That's amazing. So you work in academia, you're a, you're a professor, um, and I, I think that this, uh, you know, when you were talking earlier about sort of needing oral history, because that matches the tradition of the the people that you are studying, and it seems like this public history, too, is, is also sort of follows that same thing. You know, do you think that uh, that sort of the the academic world sort of uh, understands and appreciates those differences? Uh, the, there's sort of a, a a certain way that sort of academic historians do things, right? There, there's like a publishing that you do, and you know, but this public history is so important and so interesting. And you know, are there openings in uh, in academia for that as well? I think, and I hope we're moving toward that trend. I really think and hope that we're moving towards the digital humanities and also public history. It's kind of amazing to me, like having gone through graduate school and, and now um, being where I am now with teaching, we all possess just a wealth of knowledge about our subject areas, right? It's like, imagine if we could share that knowledge in some way with broader audiences or kind of like a more public facing audience. And so I hope that it continues to move in the trend of making information accessible and also, also engaging, like hopefully these can be teaching resources as well for students, whether they're in, you know, K through 12 or college or graduate students. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, obviously I love public history because that's what I'm doing, but um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I think it's really exciting to, to see those kind of things and, and to be able to point, you know, listeners to the podcast to, Hey, look, you can actually go watch these interviews too. I, I think is super valuable. So there are there other topics, things uh, that you wanted to make sure we talk about? Uh, we didn't talk about the the piece about kids yet. So if you wanted mm -hmm. to, to go into that as well. 
The kids piece is an interesting bit because with my writing, I don't actually focus on children's perspectives, but as I was going through my consent forms for who consented to the public facing project, um, not everyone consents for videotaping, right? Some people only consent to audio recording. Some people will do the interview anonymously. I think over the years I've interviewed like over 75 elders, some over a dozen times, like Holger Georgie Jorgensen is someone who I wrote an article with in this Anchorage Centennial Anthology. And it's because Georgie and I got along so well, <laughs> you know, like I probably met with him in person half a dozen times in Fairbanks. And then we would talk on the phone pretty regularly. So he, Georgie's also featured on the website. So as I was going through um, who gave me consent forms to kind of work on the public facing project, I realized I didn't have a lot of native women who had offered to be recorded and to be featured in a public facing project. And the native women who had consented for a videotaping and consented to a website and YouTube video were children during that time. And so the reason I have the webpage featuring the native children's perspective is because I wanted to make sure that we had native women's perspectives in there as well. And what, what was their experience like being children, you know, they're, they're presumably not in the Alaska Territorial Guard, but they must be aware of what is happening. And, you know, what, what is that experience like for them? Yeah, a number of the Native people who I've interviewed who talk about their childhood offer stories about the massive militarization of the Alaskan Territory. So frequently, Native elders will talk about being children and kind of playing on military equipment with the other kids, right? And sometimes this military equipment is also off limits. So sometimes you can't access some of these points, like places that would have been traditional fishing grounds. So sometimes you have parts of native lands that aren't accessible. And then other times you have other types of equipment right in town, (laughs) bunkers, other things like that, that you would native kids would just be playing on. (laughs) So it's, it's a really interesting time. My grandma is also from Unicleet, Betty, Betty Anagik. And she talks about being a young adult, like a teenager during the war years. And basically the massive influx of military servicemen at a base on Traeger Hill, which is right across from town. Mm -hmm. And so you go from having like this native village that's basically probably only had native people. And then in the 1940s, all of a sudden there's this influx of servicemen and there's a base right across from town. But the interesting thing about that base is looking at Traeger Hill, you wouldn't necessarily think there was ever a base there. So it's Mm -hmm. also interesting that some of these military sites have just kind of vanished. And so also on the website, I have uh, pictures of World War II military ruins to show that some of these bunkers and gunneries are still around on the landscape. You know, we think about the military and World War II uh, as the first time that American servicemen are meeting, you know, all sorts of different cultures. But it it hadn't occurred to me that it it would also be the first time for some of them that they would have met Native people. And, you know, uh, that's an interesting twist on that as well. I will be sure to put a a link in the show notes to your website so that people can, can check that out as well. Cool. Holly, thank you so much for joining me. This is such a fascinating topic and uh, and I'm, I'm really grateful that you shared your research with me. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here today, Kelly. Thanks for listening to Unsung History. You can find the sources used for this episode at unsunghistorypodcast.com. To the best of our knowledge, all audio and images used by Unsung History are in the public domain or are used with permission. You can find us on Twitter or Instagram at unsung underscore underscore history or on Facebook at Unsung History Podcast. To contact us with questions or episode suggestions, please email kelly at unsunghistorypodcast.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate and review and tell your friends. Mm-hmm.